Welcome back. This is Board Chair Linda Chinya, and I'd like to welcome you all to the public board meeting of the Baltimore City Board of School Commissioners. Just a reminder, um, if you haven't done so yet, please uh, mute your phone um, and uh, to, to uh, board members and presenters, um, you know, it will probably help us if you have your phones on mute unless I'm speaking. I'm going to first uh, do the roll call to identify the board members who are present for our meeting this evening. Members, please identify yourself also uh, before speaking uh, for the record. We will need to have that information. So uh, I'm going to go through the uh, roll call for this evening. Uh, Commissioner Von Dima. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Brooks. Commissioner Brooks, but okay. Commissioner Frank? Yes, here. Thank you. Commissioner James? Yes, ma'am. Commissioner McFadden? Here. Okay. Commissioner Reed? This. Commissioner Richardson? Here. Commissioner Roberts. Here. I see you. Is Commissioner Sykes with us? He'll be joining a, a couple minutes late. Okay, and I'm so I am counting six who are present. And four, okay, four who are absent. Is there a motion um to reopen? Okay, there's Commissioner McFadden. Is there a motion to reopen the meeting? So move, Andino. Second, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. And those in favor, Commissioner Bondima? Yes. Okay, Commissioner Frank? Yes. Commissioner James? Yes. Commissioner McFadden? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Richardson? Yes. Okay. Uh, Commissioner uh, Roberts? Yes. Okay. And I'm in favor. Okay. Did I miss anyone who's joined? No opposed. Okay. So I, so uh, this is approved seven in favor and three absent for this vote. I'm going to uh, begin our meeting as as we uh, normally do um, with a moment of silence. Um, I'd like to take this time to recognize, unfortunately, the passing of two city school students. And we um, send our deepest condolences this evening to their friends and their family. Maurice uh, Christian was a 10th grader at Achievement Academy. Hmm. He was a respectful, quiet, and well-liked student. All of his teachers and classmates speak highly of his good-mannered ma nature. And uh, the Achievement Academy school community will greatly miss Maurice. Hmm. Brian Wilkes Barnes was a part of our home and hospital program. Brian had a smile that could light up a room and lift anyone who was feeling down. He had an infectious, sweet, happy personality. Brian loved listening to music, and he really loved the song Old Town Road, smiling from ear to ear whenever he heard it. Brian's joyful soul will stay with us forever. Would you please just join me for a moment of silence in remembrance of these two students? Thank you. Now, is there a motion to approve the prior open session minutes? So moved. so moved, Richardson. And a second. Second, Robert. Thank you. And those and in favor, uh, Commissioner Bondima? Yes. 
Okay, Commissioner Frank. Yes. I see you. Commissioner James. Yes. Commissioner yes. Fadden. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Reed. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Richardson. Yes. Commissioner Roberts. Yes. Is Commissioner, I don't see Commissioner, is Commissioner Sykes here now? Okay, I'm sorry. Commissioner Brooks. Yes. Thank you. And um, I'm in favor, any, no opposed or abstain. So this motion passes. We have uh, nine in favor and one absent. And is there a motion to approve the closed session summaries? So moved. So Bundy. moved, Richardson. Okay, got Bondima um, moving and second Richardson. And uh, yes. those in favor, Commissioner Bondima? Yes. Commissioner Brooks? Yes. Commissioner Frank? Yes. Commissioner James? Yes. McFadden? Yes. Commissioner Reed? Yes. Commissioner Richardson? Yes. And Commissioner Roberts? Yes. And I'm in favor. So there are no opposed of saying this, this motion carries. We have nine in favor. Thank you. For the uh, board chair uh, comments this evening, um, I, I'm going to be doing the retirees, but I thought um, that I would like to just uh, recognize the fact that, you know, this is Black History Month. And although I actually believe that every month is Black History Month because Black history is American history, um, I did think this was a good time to reflect on the unique past that we share in city schools. And so if you will indulge me and let the teacher and me come out a little bit, I'd like to just uh, go down memory lane in terms of black history within uh, Baltimore city schools. Before uh, the landmark Supreme Court case, Brown versus Board of Education, education for black children was really minimal in Baltimore. Formal beginnings in Baltimore included, for example, the establishment of Colored School Number One in the year 1864, and it was at the corner of Calvert and Saratoga Street. And the interesting thing is that I actually attended a school that was first called the annex to that school, which was then named Colored School 115 on Merriman's Lane, I just discovered. In 1883, the first colored high school was established in Baltimore, and the first black public school teacher in Baltimore City Schools uh, during this time was Miss Roberta Sheridan. The, the, uh, the colored schools were under the direction of Dr. Francis M. Wood, in case you ever wondered where that name came from, from the school for some of us, who was called the director of those schools. And under his, his leadership, uh, the colored schools grew tremendously. He helped to bring about improvements in all the schools. Um, Douglas High School and Samuel Coleridge Taylor High School were actually constructed and completed during his time. And he organized a, an association for the teachers in Baltimore. When he... Uh, uh, retired and left, uh, Elmer Henderson, another name that many of us know from schools, served as the director of colored schools. After the Brown versus Board of Education was fully implemented in Baltimore, um, and that really took a bit of time, um, there were still some issues, especially around um, the, um, the number of teachers um, who actually worked in our schools. And so the first uh, African-American black superintendent who was hired was actually asked, I, I'm saying that nicely because he was actually forced by the U.S. Civil Rights Commission to develop a des desegregation plan. And some of you know that person as Dr. Roland Patterson. 
And then there were some other notable names that I just think we should remember as we gather here as the school board um, from the 70s to the day. Dr. John Crew, I think folks, some folks might know his name. Did you know that City College um, got, got funds to actually do one of the early renovations and to become the, lib, the, uh, the leading liberal art magnet school that we know of it as today? He was also the person who oversaw the establishment of Baltimore City's School for the Arts. Dr. Walter Ampre, who was a teacher and administrator and superintendent, was the first to pilot having outside operators managing schools. And he also reorganized the budgeting and spending so that individual schools could have greater authority. And then there was Alice Penderhughes, the first female superintendent in city schools. And I, by my count, when I sort of went through that, I don't think we've had three. Uh, Ms. Penderhughes, Dr. Charlene Cooper Boston, and our own Dr. Sonia Santelises. Dr. Samuel Banks, who some people might remember, who orchestrated one of the nation's first Afrocentric social studies curriculum. And he did that here in Baltimore City School. Or Dr. Rebecca Carroll, who was the first African-American woman to earn a doctorate from the University of Maryland College and was an assistant superintendent here for our schools. I think a lot of us remember Mr. Ralph Francois, who was an outstanding teacher and administrator. She was labeled the mother of middle schools in Baltimore for the work that she did in establishing those. And she was a tremendous board leader, both here in the city and also within the state in the work she did with me. Dr. Patricia Welsh, who was a Baltimore City school teacher for 22 years and then a professor at Morgan State University, training future teachers, and she became the Dean of the College of Education and Urban Studies. She was also the president of the school board for uh, between 2001 and 2005. And another name I remember, Dr. Mary Nicholson, who actually was one of the first black students to attend the former Eastern High School. She was the principal of Harford Heights, which at the time uh, that when Harford Heights Elementary was constructed, it was the largest elementary campus on the East Coast. And she was also an assistant superintendent. I'm not gonna keep going, but I also wanna say in addition to them, there were hundreds and hundreds and there are a dedicated, resourceful, talented, and gifted Black educators from our past, along with many who are trailblazers today and innovators of, of work that we're doing, especially those who are trying and working to conquer the world of online and hybrid education. So um, during this last week of, of Black History Week, um, I would like to just thank you for all of your service and remember those who are no longer with us for all the service and the contributions that you have made um, to our amazing and awesome Black history um, here in the Baltimore City Public Schools. So thank you all and happy Black History Month. And now I'm gonna remember some others of those great uh, folks within our system um, who have worked hard and actually have retired. Uh, this, these, these retirees, um, we, we try to honor the second meeting of each month. And so we're looking at folks who served 30 years or more. Two of our retirees uh, were scheduled to be with us. I know I heard Ms. Davis and um, hopefully Ms. Loving is also with us. Um, Ms. Claudette Davis began working with Baltimore City Schools uh, February 2nd, 1987. She most recently served as the cafeteria manager one for Dallas F. Nicholas Elementary School, right behind North Avenue there. Um, she, was, she faithfully served the children of Baltimore City Schools for 34 years. Ms. Davis, are you still there? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yes, okay. um, if you can't, we're all clapping. And please enjoy your retirement. <laughs> okay, I will. I'm sure you will. Thank you. Patricia Loving, is Miss Loving with us? Okay, well, I'm she she was hoping to be here. She might she might tune in. She began working with Baltimore City Public Schools on October 16th, 1970. 
and most recently uh, served as paraeducator for Excel Academy at William Packer Elementary School. Ms. Loving faithfully served uh, the children of Baltimore. Are you ready, folks? 50.2 years. So, Ms. Loving, if you if you can hear us, congratulations. If not, again, we send you uh, uh, our, 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 our wishes, good wishes for your retirement, and thank you for all that you've done in Baltimore City Schools. Then we have uh, Sherry Alexander, who started uh, teaching in the city schools in uh, August of 1986. Um, her last assignment was at Johnson Square Elementary, and she served 34 years and six months. Anita Carstens started her employment with the city schools August of 1985 as an elementary teacher at Pimlico. She then went to uh, Liberty Elementary School and she remained there for the rest of her career, serving uh, the students in Baltimore for 35 years and six months. Congratulations, Ms. Carstens, uh, a teacher that I had the privilege of working with when I was at Liberty. Naima Kanyata started her employment with City Schools December 1986 as an elementary teacher at Cecil. And uh, she, she served, I think she went to Gardenville where she then remained for the rest of her career serving for 34 years and two months. Congratulations. Robin Oliver, started her employment with Baltimore City Schools September 1985 as a secondary teacher at Leaf Walk and remained there for her entire career, serving the school system for 35 years and five months. Congratulations, Ms. Oliver. And then we have Eartha Sessions, who began her employment with Baltimore City Schools in October of 1973 as a food service worker at Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Um, she, uh, her, she last served at Mount Royal Elementary Middle and she served, um, was an employee for 47 years and four months. Congratulations, Ms. Sessions. To all of these folks uh, we, and, and all of our retirees, again, we say thank you and please uh, be safe and careful and enjoy your retirement. You truly deserve it. We do not have a um, items for uh, PEP and, and uh, ju quasi judicial. So I am going to, at this point, I believe, uh, turn this over to Dr. Santalisas for CEO comments. Thank you, Chair Chenya. It's good to be here this evening. And um, I, uh, there is no PEP agenda this evening, so I will uh, dive right in. Um, over the next several weeks, we will be implementing our plans uh, for expanding in-person learning options for families of students in grades K, kindergarten through fifth followed by ninth grade and high school seniors. Just as a reminder, the reopening um, expansion schedule is as follows. Kindergarten through grade two will begin next Monday, March 1st. Grades three through five and grade nine will begin Monday, March 15th. Grade 12 will begin April 12th, which is the first day of the fourth quarter. And an update on pre-kindergarten Grades six through eight and grades 10 through 11 will be provided in early March. Uh, while this is absolutely um, an exciting and long anticipated uh, opportunity for our students and families who want and need an option to return to in-person learning uh, with teachers um, who are safe and care about them, we understand that both families and staff uh, may still have questions and concerns about how all of this will work. Um, I know um, that you all want assurances uh, that our buildings will be safe, 
that mitigation strategies and protocols are in place, and that students and staff will be provided with all the resources they need to be successful. I want to emphasize that our confidence in our protocols is based on more than six months of safe in-person learning experience um, since the summer, and actually that is more than six months uh, based on where we are now and when we'll be opening. Um, and it's also um, combined with the fact that we have been conducting advanced planning around a variety of contingencies and also that these plans have been um, taken into account um, and rolled out through a measured and gradual process during that period of time. I want to send a big thanks to the dedication and hard work of our staff, um, as well as the collaboration and expertise of our partners. Um, those efforts have been both safe and successful. Of course, as I have said all along, every step we take is an exercise in trust building uh, at each point over the last number of months uh, as families have become more familiar with the protocols um, are able to see uh, the procedures in place we know that it is a trust building exercise that families respond to when they know <laughs> so when they are able to see that our buildings um, are clean and properly ventilated, that we have strictly enforced social distancing with desk shields, face masks, and full personal protective equipment, along with soap and hand sanitizer. It is, it is then that we are able to truly demonstrate and have been demonstrating our ability to provide a safe in-person option. Um, thanks to our partners, City Schools has been a leader in establishing symptomatic testing and we are finalizing asymptomatic testing, which is also really known as uh, testing for people without symptoms uh, for all of our in-person learning sites, as I mentioned at our last board meeting. Um, also, we know our teachers and school staff also need to see these same things for themselves. As of yesterday, approximately 7,300 staff members have been invited to receive vaccination through our partnerships with Johns Hopkins and the University of Maryland Medical System. That includes all staff currently working in person, as well as those starting in person ahead of students returning on March 1st, March 15th, and April 12th. As of last week, two thirds of our staff members who had signed up had either received their first dose or were offered an appointment for their first dose. Moving forward, we are awaiting final confirmation of an anticipated additional 500 doses uh, per week to be allocated for city schools. And a big thank you to the Baltimore City Health Department and additional partners. Teachers and school staff in the K-5 grade band have been invited to attend a day-long professional learning opportunity tomorrow. Uh, really that we are excited about because this is a learning opportunity that is a designed to really address uh, concerns and answers to questions that teachers have about returning uh, and staff to ensure that they are fully prepared to welcome their students back. During the course of that day, uh, staff will be able to learn more about being back in person uh, by engaging uh, their teacher colleagues who have already returned to the classroom so they can hear actual experiences firsthand, get firsthand information and testimonial, as well as um, questions and challenges. Uh, also in early March, we will be providing additional temporary staff to schools to support the testing program and other health and safety measures at schools. Um, as a parent of two city school students myself, I understand the importance of being able to see my children's classrooms and get a clear picture of what their school day will actually look like. We know that there are numbers of families in Baltimore City Schools 
that want and need the same thing. That's why schools are hosting families interested in in-person learning for open house events. Each school is hosting an open house for families to provide firsthand experience with our safety procedures and guidelines. Schools are also encouraged to demonstrate what a typical school day will entail for students through what we are calling a day in the life presentation. So with that in mind, I'm pleased to recognize Principal Najib Jamal of Lakeland Elementary Middle School and Cleo Hirsch, uh, Director of Priority Initiatives, who will provide a presentation around what school will look like, feel like, with all of the mitigation strategies in place, including providing details on our testing plan. So I am happy to turn it over now uh, to Cleo and Principal Jamal. Great, thank you, Dr. Santelisis. Um, so Principal Jamal is gonna kick us off um, talking a little bit about what school looks like and feels like with the mitigation strategies. And then I will, um, I will jump in and talk a little bit about the testing program. So, Principal Jamal, are you with us? Yep, I'm right here. Okay. Uh, good, good evening. Um, so, I want to share uh, some of the mitigation strategies that we've been using at Lakeland and other schools that have been open. Um, at Lakeland, we welcomed our first group of students back on the 21st of September and we were able to see about 60 students. We had students in the SLC, and we also had English language learners and special education um, students who came back to us at that point. In November, we added about another 50 students, uh, primarily kindergartners with one fourth grade classroom. So in this process, I think for me, you know, similar to, to, uh, to most educators, I had some concerns and apprehensions and worries uh, as a father of young children. That was the first thing on my mind, but just knowing when I was talking to parents, what it meant to them was the biggest thing that pushed me. And knowing, you know, as a child, I think my family would have needed schools to be there. So that was what drove me to step into this role and be willing to step in um, to lead in this situation. And I was I was pleased with a lot of the mitigation strategies that I found. In terms of uh, some of the strategies on this slide, it talks about the um, the commitment to the health and safety protocols. Uh, when when we were first announced that there was going to be an opening, there was a, a doctor who came. On and he shared and he shared the three W's, uh, watch your space, wear a mask uh, and wash your hands. And I think that was something that, you know, is is key and something that we really anchored our work and our daily practice in. Of course, you have the health screenings that has been a learning process from us in, you know, initially starting when the weather was warm to then transitioning it in. But through it all, we've just tried to continue to, to push for making sure that if we're following the protocols, we could do this work safely. And, and we've been able to do it so far um, with a lot of success. So I'm excited about that and seeing kids come into the building every day is, is great. When we look at the next slide, um, thinking about, you know, the uh, morning entry and arrival, students come to the building, you know, the, the big wondering is how are, particularly when we welcomed our kindergartners, how are kindergartners and young students gonna, going to come into the school? How are they going to keep their mask on? How are they going to be aware of all the rules? And is it going to be fun? And are they going to enjoy being there? And I think that was something that, you know, was a wondering and a questioning that I had as well. We were, we were able to see, you know, when I remember one student came and the first day he came in, he had a, a bulletin board that he had made a poster board and he brought it in and he was sharing it with his teacher and it was just all about him and he wanted to share and bring that excitement with him. Uh, another student came and the first day he brought roses to his teacher. So, you know, we saw the excitement and we we knew that that wasn't, you know, the mask and the shields weren't going to be a barrier. I think when when you see them in action and you see kids come in, kids adjust and, and students, you know, they want to be back and they are excited to be there. So, you know, with the mask, it's the constant reminders. We've done little things where we have, you know, similar to what teachers have brownie ch um, brownie boards in their rooms. So we'll do a mask check. And if you get the, you know, the tray full of brownies, then you get a reward. And so we've tried to set up a lot of incentives to make sure that we're getting kids a chance to be successful and see some fun out of that success. Um, in this image, you can see the process when students come in, we have the parents waiting outside. We have six foot markers. Uh, students wait, they get uh, temperature check. They get asked the questions. If there is, once they pass through that, then we let the parents know and the parents end up um, at that point there with us and we have them in the hall and we line them up. 
um, six feet apart. We do like a zombie walk, um, zombie arms in order to make sure we're keeping that distance. And it's just an extra practice for the kids to keep space. And then in the classroom, it's just, uh, you know, making sure they have their mask on. When we do have mask breaks or food, just taking a moment and that, you know, anytime the student's mask go up, um, the, the adult she face shield goes down. And that's just a practice that we have to get ourselves used to and have been successful with. You can see a little movement breaks, obviously, um, you know, part of the fun of being back in school. You know, classroom setup, uh, you can see two different classroom structures here. You know, the teachers really personalize it and have been amazing at, uh, at bringing, you know, the excitement back into the classroom. And I think they're the ones who really make the big difference and have been the heroes in this work. Um, you know, stu students are grouped into pods and really keeping them as, as a cohort that doesn't interact with other cohorts. Um, each room has the air purifiers, and that's been something for us that, you know, has been a reassurance on top of the distance. The desks are always six feet apart. There are markers there. Um, and then you have the desk shields up, you know, as a safety uh, procedure. But, you know, once you get past and used to some of those initial things that can throw you off, I think you, you get back to a normalcy in terms of school and just students interacting and being used to being back in school and the fun returning. Great. Thank you so much, Principal Jamal. Um, and just thank you for all your work leading in-person learning um, and really being a pioneer for us. It's just you've just been such a fantastic partner. So um, he got to do the fun part. I'm going to pivot to something a little more technical, um, which is the details of a new mitigation strategy um, uh, that we will be starting um, the second week of March, which is um, asymptomatic te COVID testing, which is also, as Dr. Santelisa said, testing everybody in the building, even if they don't have symptoms. Um, so I'm going to provide a little overview of our, our testing program. So first, as a reminder, I know we've talked about this before, but City Schools has had a uh, symptomatic testing program running since December. And this program um, is done in partnership with the health department, the state department of health and the University of Maryland. And it's really been fantastic. It allows us to respond if any of our students or staff uh, feel sick with COVID like symptoms. And we're able to order a mobile unit um, with trained nurses who come to school and they do a test on that person as well as any of their close contacts. The individuals receive their own test results through the University of Maryland My Portfolio system. Um, and also, if any family member is on site and their child is getting tested because they're feeling sick, we, we test the parents. So we've been able to test a lot of our families as well, just to provide that comfort and peace of mind to make sure that they all know um, about their own health status. So that program is ongoing and that, that will continue as we expand um, and we will have more mobile units um, to accommodate the, the needs of the schools as we open more schools. Next slide. Great, so this is um, the new testing program, um, which is uh, survey testing, um, also known as asymptomatic or no symptom testing. Um, and how this will work is that students and staff will be tested each week, um, regardless of whether they have symptoms. Um, the testing cadence over time will be determined by community conditions, so we will be starting with weekly testing, and the CDC has issued guidance that explains, based on where you are, here's how much testing you should do. So we will be following that guidance um, over time. All tests will be PCR tests. This just means they're the really good tests. They take um, about 24 hours, and they're able to be very, very precise and are considered the gold standard for COVID-19 testing. And testing will look a little different if you're in a high school as a staff or a student versus if you're in an elementary school. So for high schools, we will be doing individual saliva-based PCR testing, which means that each person will drool into a tube and they will get their own test results. Um, this is seen as a good approach for high schools because it's a little bit harder to group high schools into those cohorts or pods that Principal Jamal was speaking of. And so we have this really rigorous individualized testing program to ensure that students are able to access an academic model that makes sense for high schoolers um, while maintaining the you know, really high levels of um, health and safety protocols. And so that's why the high schools will be uh, following 
this individual saliva-based PCR testing model. For elementary schools, we will be doing pooled nasal PCR testing. Um, so I'm going to show you a video of what that looks like in a moment. But the high level idea is that you uh, group the kids into pods or cohorts and you test them as a pool. Um, and that really fits well with our academic model for the elementary schools. Next slide. So before I get into this, I'm wondering if Joe, you wouldn't mind showing the video. And what Joe is going to show you is a video of what elementary school pooled testing looks like in a Baltimore City school that has been running a pilot program for us. Um, they've really been doing a phenomenal job. And so I'll let the video speak for itself. We're going to each classroom, collecting a nasal swab that each child is able to independently do their own swab. It's like, was it checking for boogers, right? Let's see. Kids would simply pick their nose. It's the same type of level of depth where the swab goes. It doesn't go any further. And a lot of kids just say it tickles. Four circles in each nostril. We'll count you down. We'll encourage you. One, two, three. Four. Okay, next nostril. Insert the swab, the collection, into a tube, and we mail that off to our partner, Ginkgo, who tests the entire pool, in this case, is a classroom. And a very quick response, we get to find out within 36 to 72 hours, it does reduce some anxiety of the unknown. If it's negative, class goes undisturbed. Four, good job. Three, four, right. And our teachers participate, so I think it really feels like very much of a community effort of we're all keeping each other safe. The scholars have been great about um, actually doing the pooling testing. Um, most of them are pretty excited to do it. They want to be a part of it. We took time as a staff to help them understand uh, the purpose behind it as well as families. So meeting with families personally. Most of our families were really excited about the opportunity. They welcomed it. Um, it made them feel safer, which is our ultimate goal, to make sure that families feel safe. It's going to go to about 100, over 100 elementary schools, and it's just going to be a part of our regular health screening process to make sure that students are able to participate in a safe environment, healthy environment, and get their in-school learning. Thank you, Joe. Um, so huge shout out to Principal Brooks and to Ariel Humphreys, who's one of our project managers, actually making all of this testing happen, as well as, as you saw, working with schools on the ground uh, to support them. So as you saw in the video, um, we're grouping students at the elementary level into pools. Um, uh, so often this will be a class, or if there's two really small classes, they could be combined. And then it, it's a way to be able to test kids very quickly, um, through a self-administered test and then get the results back that let us know um, is the whole class COVID negative or there'll be like a red flag if anyone in that pool tests positive and that enables us to know that we need that group of students and staff to quarantine. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but it's, it's essentially a group test. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, so a key thing for us when we set our testing strategy was self-administered tests. This has just been a lot better for students. They feel more comfortable being able to do it themselves. It doesn't hurt. It's non-invasive. Um, kids get really good at it really quickly, as you saw from our, our students who have just adapted to it um, in a matter of weeks. And um, it also is safer for both staff and students if you can self-administer because it allows us to maintain social distance at all time. Um, and so that was a really important thing we looked for in a testing strategy. Next slide. So because the tests are grouped into a class or a pool, as we say, um, you may be wondering how we respond if a test or if a pool were to come back positive. So if uh, I sent my child to school and I got a note, I would get a notification from my child if they did their pool testing, and it came back positive. What my principal would be able to tell me is that somebody in my student's class tested positive for COVID because all the uh, tests are grouped. We, we don't have isolated individual results. It's, it's, a, it's a unit test. So then you would want to, of course, quarantine everyone in that classroom pod um, for the 14 full days. But we also know that families are going to want individual information. What is the health status of my child? And so we're really pleased that we have the symptomatic testing program in place. 
and we will be able to invite families back to campus the next day to get an individual test so that while their baby's out on quarantine, they will have detailed information um, about their own child's health status. And at that time, if a parent wanted to get tested, they would be able to get tested too. So um, it's really a, a multi-layered strategy to make sure everyone has the information they need while we minimally disrupt education and allow schools to continue uh, rolling. Next slide. So high school is a little different. It's actually a little more straightforward because it's more of the standard COVID test we've all heard about. Um, it's an individual test. Um, in this case, it's a saliva-based test, which is a very, very reliable method of uh, doing a PCR COVID test. Um, and so each person will drill into a little tube. The principals will receive the test results from their school on a set schedule. So if you test every Monday, you would get the results every Tuesday morning, for example. And then students and staff will have access to their own test results through a web-based app. Um, so parents will be able to register and you'll actually be able to see your own child's weekly test results online. Um, so we'll send more information as we get closer to the start data about how families can register for that app. Next slide. This is just a little graphic. Um, the tube is actually really tiny. You don't have to drool a lot. I know it looks really big in the graphic, but you just to give a little bit of drool into a small little tube. Um, again, self-administered to keep the students and staff safe. Um, you hand it over to our health and safety coordinator, which is, as Dr. Santelis has mentioned, staff that we're putting in each school to help with this process. They'll scan it, and then 24 hours or less later, the parent or guardian can receive the results about their child, and the staff will receive their own test results. And the COVID response process is as you would expect. If somebody receives a positive test result, they will be immediately isolated in the wellness room. Families would be contacted. And we have a central contact tracing team who would identify all the close contacts to that individual. They would also be asked to isolate for 14 days. Um, and that will enable us with this proactive testing to quickly identify anybody who may have um, COVID-19 and um, isolate them to allow the rest of the school to continue to operate safely. And that was a lot of information, but Dr. Santelises, I promise I'm done. So back to you. Thank you very much, um, Cleo and Principal Jamal, uh, just for you know your work, um, both uh, at the school level as well as bringing testing and giving us some insight and a picture of what school looks like um, and then the day of the life of a student who will be returning to in-person learning. Um, I also want to give a special thanks uh, to the full team that has been working for months to build out a comprehensive COVID-19 testing program. Um, I, I want to give a special shout out to Chief Perkins Cohen um, and her leadership in this. Um, in addition, to our partners at University of Maryland Medical System, the Baltimore City Health Department, our Public Health Advisory Committee. The district has worked with the Rockefeller Foundation and a consortium of Washington DC based universities, uh, gaining access to shared best practices, prices based on the large volume buying power of the consortium and free access to a local testing lab. We have also been working with several other Maryland school districts to share best practices and further increase um, our mutual buying power. I'm deeply grateful to everyone who has collaborated since the fall to ensure that staff and students can return safely to in-person learning so that many of our young people in need of in-person learning will have access in a way that is safe for both they and our staff. I would like to now introduce Dr. Lynette Washington, Chief Operations Officer and Dr. Nicole Stewart to discuss our building readiness and announce the availability of our redesigned air quality dashboard. Uh, thank you, Dr. Washington. You can take it from here. Thank you, Dr. Santelises. I am, okay, great. So, 
uh, and good evening, commissioners. So, so I'm going to um, introduce our air filtration dashboard, um, and Dr. Stewart is going to support me in walking through an example, um, just so you can understand how the dashboard is going to be used. Um, but before we jump into that, I just want to um, just remind everyone about our air filtration solution for our buildings. Um, it is something that we've been talking about since last year that we would be moving forward and updating filters in our buildings to MERV 13 filters, which are more finer filters to address some particles in the air due to um, the COVID virus. Um, and then also that we would be using HEPA air filters um, and HEPA air filters are not a subpar alternative. It is either MERV 13 filters or the HEPA um, air filter purifiers in some of our classroom spaces. And so one of the other things that I also want to mention is that some of our buildings, one of the things you will see is temporary solutions in some of our buildings. So of the 103 schools that are receiving the MERV 13 upgrade, um, we have been impacted by um, the supply chain as it relates to MERV 13 upgrade. So some of our buildings are still going through that process. We are providing the HEPA air purifiers that are permanent solutions in 62 buildings. We're providing it in some of the 103 buildings that are getting the MERV 13 upgrades. So providing a, that safeguard until the MERV 13 upgrades are completed. So I just wanna make sure that we're just a reminder of this is what our filtration solution is. So we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and so in terms of uh, building readiness, I also want to um, just direct everyone that there is a frequently asked questions. And so if you want additional details about MERV 13s in your building, if the building is assigned for MERV 13s, or you want additional information about the HEPA air filters, how effective they are, this is all located within this frequently asked question um, that is within the dashboard and also on our website. So as of to date, we have about 91 of our buildings that are ready um, from February the 22nd. We have 27 of our buildings that are 80 to 98 percent, meaning that there is a classroom here or there that still needs some additional like air purifier. And so we are addressing that. And then we have 18 of our buildings that maybe there was an additional increase in enrollment, some classroom changes um, that are 60 percent or less spaces that are ready. All of these spaces will be addressed by Friday, which is February the 26th. We have about 27 of our other spaces that are middle and high school spaces that will be target readiness date is Friday, February, uh, March 12th. Um, so again, if you have additional questions about your um, the status of your building, um, the frequently asked questions will um, address some of the details around the MERV 13s and the HEPA purifiers. You can go to the next slide. Um, so a dashboard uh, has is been made available and one of the purposes for the dashboard is for us to be transparent with our families, our communities, um, and also school community and administration about how we're moving forward and dealing with the air filtration readiness for their particular buildings as we prepare for in-person learning. Um, one of the things I just want to point out for the dashboard is that it addresses the various conditions of our spaces. And that was something that it was a concern for families. They wanted to understand how spaces were actually being used currently and then how spaces would going, were going to be used the March 1 and March 15th. And it was a particular lift for our team. So I want to appreciate uh, Dr. Stewart's team and also um, Monique Romo and her team for the lift in um, trying to merge these two things so that we can communicate what's happening in our buildings. And so Dr. Stewart is going to walk through the visual visualization and how you can read um, your space is ready. Um, so Dr. Stewart, if you wanna take the next slide. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and so you can find the in-person learning air quality dashboard on our city schools website. If you go to uh, the website and you search for buildings dashboard, um, a link will come up. Uh, there's a page with that frequently asked questions uh, as well as a link directly uh, to the dashboard itself. Uh, and so this is an example of what the dashboard looks like when you go to that link. On the very left side, there um, is information about um, just all the different um, uh, conditions of a classroom that make it ready. So as Dr. Washington mentioned, some schools are getting a filter upgrade, some schools are getting um, the air purifier. So the information 
um, for how to understand what's in the dashboard is in that about section. And then as you go uh, to the right, there's a drop down. So you're able to search for your school. So this is an example, um, Garrett Heights. Uh, which is a filter upgrade school. And so you are able to filter on the uh, name of the program. Uh, you can then go to the right and see that the building um, status is ready. So what that means is that 31 of the 31 spaces that have been identified for in-person use um, have uh, been covered by that filter upgrade. And then also what we wanted to do is in the in the instance where, um, as you saw tonight, some schools have been operating um, as SLC sites or they had classrooms in November, we also wanted to show the extent to which those classrooms were also ready. Um, and then at the bottom in that next um, box next to that says not this particular school was not used um, in the fall, but other schools, of course, were. And those ready classrooms reflect there. Then at the bottom is the actual individual classroom level information where uh, based on the legend, you can see that uh, that this school is, I'm sorry, the classrooms in this school, the space readiness is complete because that filter upgrade has been completed um, at this location. And then this is just the same example, but just a school that is an air purifier school. And you can just see at the very right that the green check marks indicating that air purifiers uh, have been installed. So I want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Washington for giving us an opportunity to uh, share this with the public. Uh, if there are questions, there are, there are um, emails and contact information in the uh, actual dashboard. And also just want to take an opportunity to thank the facilities planning team for their efforts to uh, prepare this for the public. Thank you. Great. Well, I want to give a big thank you again to uh, Dr. Washington, Dr. Stewart, um, and your whole team's work um, over the past number of weeks um, to make sure that this critically important tool is ready for um, our staff, our families, um, and teachers, everyone returning um, or considering in, uh, uh, excuse me, um, in-person um, learning. I think the conclusion for this is that we really are sparing uh, no effort to fulfill our pledge to offer safe in-person learning opportunities for every student who needs our support. I am deeply grateful to all those who have worked so hard and successfully in a spirit of uh, partnership and collaboration to make a positive contribution towards successful in-person learning options. And then finally, uh, earlier today, the State Department of Education released the 2020 graduation and dropout uh, rates report. Here are some high level results. We will be coming back uh, to a public board meeting to discuss these results in more depth. Um, the overall four year graduation rate for city schools uh, decreased slightly from 70.3% in 2019 to 70% in 2020. Um, the overall four-year dropout rate improved, improved by 2.8 percentage points, uh, decreasing from 15.9% in 2019 to 13.1% in 2020. Uh, we saw marked improvements in our students with disabilities, English learners, and Latino students. Um, in both four year graduation and dropout rates, uh, the over uh, the overarching uh, themes we will um, discuss uh, again in more depth in coming weeks. We will continue to do everything we can uh, to accelerate our young people's trajectory towards success um, and really help to transition and support out of what has uh, been a ch uh, challenging year uh, for all of us. That concludes my remarks for this evening. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Chinya. And before I turn it over, one of the things that I did want to point out, I was remiss, um, is we have had requests for some preliminary data about students returning in person uh, that we uh, are making available. 
Um, as of February 22nd, 2021, which was yesterday, if I um, uh, am thinking correctly, uh, we have 25.3% uh, of K-5 uh, families opting for in-person. Um, as many might remember, this was about the target that we had predicted based on um, early responses to student learning centers and in-person learning opportunities in the fall. Our high school response rate is extremely preliminary because there is still time for students to opt in at that level. Uh, that high school uh, option uh, opt-in rate stands at about 10.4% um, returning in person. We also know um, that if we look uh, at a racial breakdown, what we see is that uh, the total uh, percentage of black students K through five in the district is 73.9% and 67.1% of black students um, are part of the returning in-person um, cohort. Uh, amongst Latino students, 19.6% uh, of those students uh, of students returning in person uh, are Latino and uh, Latino students make up 15.3% of the total K through five population. Um, that is just some of the overview for, uh, excuse me, for white students. We have 10.4% uh, of returning students um, are white uh, as opposed to, or in comparison to um, white students making up 7.9% of K-5 students um, district-wide. Um, and we also know for English language learners, we have about 15.4% of students returning in person are EL, uh, or English learners, and uh, their district uh, distribution, the percentage of K-5 students in the district that are EL students is 11.6%. And then with students with disabilities, it is, it's fairly close. 13% of students returning for in-person are students with disabilities. Um, and 12.3% of students in kindergarten through fifth grade um, are, uh, are students with disabilities um, across the entire uh, K through five. So we will, uh, this uh, data will be posted as well. Um, it is to give some indication because we knew we were getting um, questions. Folks wanted to know what the in-person response looked like, um, and that's where we stand um, as of yesterday. So now, Chair Chinya, my apologies. I will now turn it back over to you officially. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, before moving on, uh, we had indicated that we would have time if board members had comments or wanted to uh, ask any questions following the uh, detailed update. Uh, Commissioner Frank, and then I see Commissioner Bondima. Dr. Santelisis, I'm not sure if your team is still on the line. The question about the asymptomatic testing, can you speak to how what our policy and practices will be, our best practices are, and how it compares to the CDC recommendations that came out? the differences between what we're doing and what was recommended as a baseline for opening schools? Sure, so I will, you mean specifically with the asymptomatic testing or overall, Commissioner Frank? Specifically the asymptomatic testing. Great, I'll turn that over to uh, both uh, Chief Perkins Cohen and uh, Ms. Hirsch. Allison, do you wanna start or do you want me to start? Yeah, so uh, why don't you start, you start, okay. yeah. Sure, so that's a great question. So um, the we've actually, as Dr. Santelisa said, been met, working on this for months, but one of the benefit of having partners such as the Rockefeller Foundation um, and folks who are working with the transition is that luckily the plans are highly aligned to the CDC guidance, although they obviously just came out on Friday. So 
Um, the CDC guidance says that as a baseline, schools really must have symptomatic testing, which we're proud to have been running since December, um, and that's key. And then they recommend what they call screening testing or asymptomatic testing, but it's not required. Um, and if they do, if you, you know, and we've obviously chosen to do that as an additional mitigation strategy, um, if schools are doing it based, um, they've set sort of a recommended cadence of testing based on the community conditions at hand. So based on our community conditions currently, the recommendation would be that you we would do weekly testing, which is why we are doing weekly testing. We are halfway between low and moderate right now, according to the CDC's rankings. Once you get to low, the testing cadence recommendation changes. And so we are starting with the most conservative interpretation of the guidance, and then we will um, you know, adjust our cadence and practice over time in line with that guidance and how our own community conditions um, uh, evolve and we hope continue to improve. So we are squarely in line with what the latest guidance is for screening testing. Thank you. And the only thing I would add to that is that the testing, um, the, the our positivity rates are continuing to go down and our community conditions are continuing to improve. So if that continues and if the vaccine, the percentage of the population who gets vaccinated increases, those are conditions that might make it um, where we don't need to test quite as often. So we could test less frequently. We could test, we could maybe change our testing uh, method. So there's different things we could consider um, as we continue to watch the community conditions. Commissioner Bondima and then Commissioner Roberts will follow you. Hey, thank you very much, commissioners. Um, my question basically has been answered, but, and so I'm left with one question, and this is for the community's sake. Um, and you did emphasize the fact that the parents and, and communities were involved, but how will we get the message out to parents, community leaders who are not listening in our presentations and who are not aware of all the steps that you've taken to get to this point. What kind of communications literature are you getting to the communities and to the families so they will know exactly step by step what's going on, not just hearing it in our board meeting, I mean, excuse me, in our public hearing, but where they can look at it. Are we sending out literature and giving it to the students or giving it to the parents and all the parents in the, in the district? No, thank you, Commissioner Bondima, um, for that question because it's very important. Um, first, one of the things that our communications team, uh, both Mr. Riley, uh, you know, Chief um, High Cupboard, um, are have been working on um, information graphics that will make an easy um, orientation because you know the the medical science behind testing can be complex, but as I think Cleo showed earlier with the video. Um, the actual practice itself um, can be boiled down into kind of simple graphics to make it easier to understand for parents like me that are on the go and may not want to read five paragraphs. Um, so that's one thing. The other piece is we will have posted the more detailed information, the video you saw last night um, on the district website for families to access. And then also, I think a really important point that you saw in um, the, Morav the, the, the video of Moravia is you could see the school's orientation for families as well. So in addition to you know, what we put out centrally, um, that school did their own orientation, had a chance for teachers and for families to learn within their school environment what it will look like. But, Chief uh, Perkins Cohen, do you have anything to add on that? I mean, not much. I think you covered it. I just will just reemphasize that because the board decision tonight about the procurement um, needed to happen before we could do anything, this is really the kickoff of when we're going to really do intense communication. And just kudos to Chief High Cupboard and to um, Andre Riley, who have really thought about how to do that. But we'll do town halls, we'll um, do the graphics that Dr. Sandalise has talked about. We'll be standing up a website at some point this week that will have kind of dedicated information about testing because there is a there's a heavy lift of getting information out now um, so that people feel have the information they need to make a decision. Thank you. Commissioner Roberts. 
Madam Chair, my question was actually around yeah, communications as well. well. It, it was the uh, same question. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> then, then. Uh, uh, Commissioner, Commissioner are you, are you, are your hand still up or are you no, just you a, have another, another question? Another question around the cost of the comprehensive COVID response program and the sources of funds that are available to the district that we, we know about and those that we might anticipate that are coming. So um, the in the board letter, you'll see we put in the kind of high end estimates um, that we're we're putting in for this. It is a lot of tea leaf reading, frankly, in terms of trying to estimate what the cost is going to be, because while we do have some information about who's coming back, um, we don't know, you know, when we bring back other grades, who's going to come back, or if additional families may want to come back. We also, those community conditions we mentioned earlier may result in less testing um, that we might do, or we could change testing um, protocols if there's a if there's another test that's cheaper, that's easier to administer, we, we could change at some point. So it's a little bit hard to guess. I would say the numbers that you're seeing in the board estimate are definitely high, very high estimates through December of what, or through January um, uh, of what we think it could be. But that is a really high, um, we think that is a very high number um, because uh, because of the tea leave reading. We're trying to make sure we have enough money put away for it, but we hope it would be significantly less than that. And Commissioner Frank, I would just add that a significant portion of the funding is uh, coming from some of the uh, the CARES federal dollars um, that have been allotted to support school safety and um, and other things, you know, clearly associated with COVID. So I just wanted to add that's where, you know, at least some of this initial funding is coming from. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Brooks. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. Um, one of the, um, I know that going into this um, reopening or rather this expansion, um, trust is critical um, and it's gonna be central to ensuring that families have the most accurate information about um, COVID-19 rates of transmission and so forth. Um, so with that being said, my question is how do we ensure that sort of the metrics that we're saying that we're going to follow, that they're actually followed. And then if there are changes being made to the ways in which things are communicated, that that is systematically put out. So it doesn't look like we're not following CDC guidance and recommendations um, given sort of like our last, um, it look, it appeared as if the district had disregarded our own sort of metrics, um, uh, particularly around a COVID positivity rate. So I'm just looking for some clarity around sort of how do we ensure that. Okay. So um, it's nice sitting next to Dr. Sandalis as we can decide who, who's ready to answer these questions. It's good. Uh, so um, I think what we've uh, what we've been doing so far with that, Commissioner Brooks, is that um, we, when we get, when the CDC comes out with guidance, we bring that guidance to our health advisory committee and to the health department, and they review it with us, and we think about the implementation impl implications for it. So sometimes the, there are guidance that, you know, um, may actually make, um, make it less restrictive in schools, but we think that the amount of time it may take to implement that or the, um, and we've just done training for the previous guidance. And so we kind of keep with the more conservative guidance while we're thinking through the kind of training we need to do in order to get people up to speed on the new guidance. So that's part of what we take into consideration is, um, is you know especially when the generally what's been happening is the restrictions are kind of relaxing and sometimes if they're relaxing and we feel like we still need a little bit more time with the restrictions we already have in place that we've trained people on before we we go to that lower level then we we consult with our health advisory group about the applicability of it and and real have real conversations about implementation and then we implement it and our standard operating procedures that are on our website are updated regularly so every time they're updated um, those go out and there's a red line strikeout that shows you all the changes that are made. So huge kudos to Sharika Bolton on our staff, who's the one who's the key author of that, who takes all that information from the CDC, the feedback from the health advisory committee, and she digests it in a red line strikeout that gets reviewed by all the key departments and then goes out in a way that everybody can see every time there's a change in that. Um, so those are the key ways that we we internalize that information. Great. I, so, I, so I'm just trying to a point of clarity. So, are you saying sort of once the the, the Fed sort of releases their particular um, guidelines, 
uh, we sort of come, it comes to us, and then the the committee or the, the, the health committee sort of interprets that for or on behalf of or in consult with the district. And then that's how we sort of see any changes, even if our local sort of um, metrics um, may sort of be out of alignment, you all have a separate conversation to determine whether or not we should be able to forego some of those things. And my point is, is then how do we get that sort of communicated to the families? Yeah, I think part of that commissioner um, is working with the health department. So even though it's the health advisory group, it's also city health department. And I think part of what um, we're frankly, you know, learning how to do better as we go is to actually communicate out what those adjustments are. But it, it also goes through the Baltimore City Health Department because they actually are the keepers of Baltimore City data. Like we go to our health advisory for, you know, it's, it's how we, we actually anticipated the ventilation needs long before they became a national discussion because of the health advisory. When it comes to the local metrics, we actually work in consult with Baltimore City Health Department because they really are the keepers of local uh, local health uh, health data. That relationship combined with the state health department was, I think, part of what was getting worked out the end of the year, right? Is that the state department of health was getting ready to change some of their recommendations. The local health department was looking at their, you know, at what our local um, conditions were. So that that's what we uh, that's what we actually do, like in terms of you know metrics. We consult with, again, Baltimore City Health Department about what our local um, measures look like because they're, like I said, I don't know a more direct way to say it except they're the keepers of the local the local health data. So that that's another point. It's not just the health advisory board. It's also what the health department is saying about things like spread and hospitalization rate and level of infection and, and all of those, because they're looking, they know where across the city um, they have concerns or pockets. So it, it is the health advisory committee, but it is also very much the health department. Okay, so I guess my last point is then, so when those uh, particular sort of entities come together, so I know that they, at one point there was a 5% positivity rate, in which case we would sort of reevaluate that. So was it just a communication um, error in terms of not communicating that change out because the committee had already determined as a unit that the, that some areas didn't need to sort of, uh, the metrics could be fluxed a little bit? Um, or is that, was there some, some other sort of dynamic that was playing out there? Yeah, I think it was a combination of that, um, Commissioner Brooks. So I think some of it was yes in consultation with um, the health advisory committee some of it is with actually the health department right so it was for example in november it was consultation around so are we going with small groups or are we going with larger groups coming back if we had we're going with larger groups coming back then i think the weighing in would have been different at the same time that the state was looking at its communication out around the five percent and when we checked in with the state, the state said, well, you're doing small groups. So you're within what we were describing. So I do think some of it is a communication alignment piece. And I do agree that we need to have a way of, frankly, also sifting through some of the changing information and interpretation we're getting from the entities that we're responsible to. And I think this point about how we update the community around that is definitely, thank you, is definitely a learning um, from the last six to seven months in particular, particularly during that November period where some of that information was changing and when we really were checking in uh, with both state and local officials. So I think the question is going to be how do we, how quickly can we communicate that those shifts to the public, to families in a way that their, their understanding the changes that are happening because what we know about the virus now is not what we knew about the virus a year ago. And so there are going to be, you know, changes from the health community, not necessarily from us along the way. Yeah, and I just want to, I just kind of raise that because I think those are incidents of actual trust destroying experiences, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it begins to look like 
we are sort of moving the mark. And those, all of those things that begin to deteriorate the trust that the community needs uh, and sort of expect for us. And so if we're trying to get people in the door, um, sort of moments like that become big departures uh, for that. So I just kind of want to flag that uh, as a, a right. Now, useful flag. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Sykes, I believe, has, has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, my question is uh, referring to staff and students who uh, may have already received the COVID-19 vaccination, their first and second dose. Um, so say if a teacher, if the students might not have a board of our uh, students within the classroom um, receives or uh, uh, contracts COVID-19, are we still asking our teachers um, who is in the classroom, although yes, they have their vaccination first and second dose, are we still asking them to um, uh, quarantine for 14 days, which is the first question. The second question is, I just want to clarify um, because I've been getting a lot of uh, text messages and phone calls um, about high school students re um, relating to uh, returning. And I think that we, um, some of our high school students have the perception that they have to return to, to a high school, um, that they have, like it is mandatory that they return. So I just want to make sure that we take the time to clarify that this is this is an option for for parents um, who feel safe with their students coming back uh, for the grades that we're offering to come back. Well, I will start with your second question, Commissioner Sykes, and I want to thank you for flagging that. And at any opportunity possible, I will absolutely reaffirm and confirm what you just said, and that is it is optional. It is absolutely optional return. Um, there is no family that is compelled to come back for high school students that um, and their families who feel more comfortable remaining in a virtual space, they will absolutely have that option. So I appreciate you flagging that so that we can say it again and um, make sure that we're saying it continually so that folks understand. So thank you for that, Commissioner Sykes. Um, and then your first question around um, vaccine. Let me make sure I, I heard you right. So correct me, sir, if, if, if not, OK? Um, that your question was if a, a teacher has been has received the full dose of the vaccine um, and and a student or someone else is found to be COVID positive, will that vaccinated individual still need to quarantine for 14 days? Did I get your question right? You got it right on the nose. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Um, so I'm going to uh, turn that over to uh, uh, Cleo Hirsch because she's the she knows the protocols on this one. Go ahead. Yes. It's a really important question, so thank you for asking it. Um, the answer is that at this time, everybody, if you are vaccinated or not, have to continue to follow all of the health and safety protocols, including quarantine and testing. And I just am, would like to explain why, because I know it can be frustrating if you got vaccinated. And that is because we don't yet have enough data to determine if vaccinated uh, people can still spread um, the virus to people who are unvaccinated. And so until we get to a point where everyone has access to the vaccine, we all have an obligation to follow the protocols to keep our one another safe, um, our fellow classmates and teachers. And so because of that, um, both testing and quarantine rules will, um, you know, and, and uh, testing protocols and quarantine rules will be for everybody, regardless of their vaccination status. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Santelises. Thank you, all of the uh, your staff. And I know uh, we, we talk to them on a weekly, almost daily basis, to be honest. But uh, thanks for the tremendous work. And I, I I'm hoping that um, it's it's pretty evident when I when I hear and then read uh, what's going on at other places that we really are on the cutting edge in terms of best practices and and uh, innovation in terms of meeting this this uh, this situation. So thank you again. Thank you, Chair Chania. We're going to move on. Yeah, we're going to move on to the uh, consent agenda review. Um, we always do this prior to uh, public comment. Uh, commissioners, um, I, I will review them, but I want to tell you first that I'm actually going to be pulling items um, 8.01 through 8.03 uh, 
so that our student commissioner can vote on them. But I also want to ask if any other commissioner uh, has a specific question about those that you would like to have uh, some uh, discussion or response for. Okay. All right. Madam, so then Madam I move Vice on to, yeah. It's Commissioner Roberts. I actually do have a question for 1101 and 1102. Okay. Um, okay. Hang on. A, I'm getting there, but I want, I'm asking about 8.01 to oh. 8.03 right now. So, okay. So there are no questions. So they're just going to go for the vote with the student committee. Okay. Now I'll go on to 11.01. Um, uh, and you can let me know if you want to pull it and what the question might be. Eleven zero one is. Mm -hmm. So my question is actually for the both. It's the same question for both of them. For eleven oh one and eleven oh two. Okay, eleven point zero one. Let me just say what it is. Shield T three Health and eleven point zero two is Ginkgo uh, Bioworks Incorporated. So go ahead with the question. My question is around charter schools and how they're included in the two procurement. Did you hear me, Madam Chair? I, I did not, but say, if you say it again. My question is around charter schools and how they're included in the two procurement. Okay. Inclusion of uh, how charter schools are uh, included or impacted. With the, okay, got it. Thank you. All right. Uh, any others? If not, then um, I'm going to move into public comment. And um, we have speakers from our recognized groups who will uh, have the opportunity to speak for five minutes. And so first we have uh, Ms. Is it Ms. Tisha Lester, who's representing the Baltimore Teachers Union this evening. Right, give me one moment. Okay. Hello, everyone. Greetings. My name is Tishia Lester. I am currently with the Baltimore Teachers Union on the PSRP member engagement team. Previously, I was a community school coordinator and teacher. My expertise is with community work and organizing. Let's just begin and say that we are living through a very dangerous time. So with that being said, Baltimore Teachers Union created a petition that now has over 5,000 signatures. It's called Only When It's Safe. Teachers, PSRPs, students, families, and community members agree that they are more conditions needed for school buildings to be safe. Now, for the last three weeks, I received so many phone calls and emails from my colleagues that they're just so scared um, and just expressing how terrified they are to go back to school. They don't feel safe and they know they won't be fully vaccinated for the mandated return. Many schools don't even have a comprehensive plan in place. A large group of students are returning to school in less than a week. All safety measures have not been met. Many Baltimore City public schools don't have the proper ventilation. And honestly, 21st century schools don't even have windows that open. The district ventilation dashboard shows many elementary schools is still showed in progress and not completed. So the reopening plan still has a lot of kinks. And there needs to be more organization. City schools have chosen a system where any family who opt in returns to an in-person programming, regardless of their needs. And other districts around the country who've chosen a similar plan have seen a disproportionate amount of white and higher economic status families come back. The result is that instead of our media students getting an educator's undivided attention, they'll just get a Zoom in another room. Only this time, 
you'll get a teacher wearing a mask and dividing their attention between other in-person students. This will not close any learning gaps, by the way. At this time, I would also like to share some comments from our petition on when it's safe. Our first time it says, I am a partner in city schools. My office is in a school building with a recent COVID case. It's not safe and I don't feel safe being there. Employees won't be vaccinated in time. I'm a teacher and I vehemently disagree with the current reopening plan. I have someone else that says, I just retired January the 1st, 2021, after 30 years of the Baltimore City public school system. I want my friends, colleagues, former students, and families to be safe. Someone else says, the decision to return seems rushed and an ill out thought. I don't feel like my grandchildren will be safe returning to school at this time. The information we have been receiving is very contradictory. We need a plan that makes sense. Our educators are a precious resource. We must protect them. What is being reported as why we can safely return in person is absolutely not the reality of what we're walking into. Educators' lives are valuable. Saving lives is non-negotiable. Returning is not worth the risk. I am a parent and a teacher. Someone else says, I don't think it's a big task to ask. Make sure that the schools are safe. Before we reopen, take the time, do the work, spend the money, and then reopen. And last but not least, it says, my husband and children have a condition that makes them more vulnerable to the virus. I don't want to bring it home to them. So I'm just asking the district to reconsider, reconsider opening so soon. Also, if anyone is interested in signing this petition, please go to BaltimoreTeachers.org. Make it make sense only when it's safe. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have Ms. Yasmin Blanchard, who's re representing the Associated Congress. For I'm sorry, is it? Okay, I'm sorry. I, I was hearing something, or maybe it was echo. We have Ms. Yasmin Blanchard representing the Associated Student Congress for Baltimore City. Hello, hello everyone. I'm here, well, like you heard the ASCBC to talk about the LGBTQIA community in Baltimore City Public Schools and what happens when our staff and administration aren't open and enthusiastic allies. As a high school student struggling with grades of social life in this pandemic, it can already make life tough. But when you add having to figure out who you are and where you fit in, things just become a mess. The LGBTQIA community in schools needs to know that city schools, administration, and staff are on our side. Having teachers who aren't always sensitive and enthusiastic allies, as well as sometimes openly hostile towards this community, can be very upsetting personally, and it can also disrupt our learning. LGBTQIA can be seen as an umbrella term, where everyone in it is the same, and that simply couldn't be farther from the truth. Having teachers who are uneducated on the topic, whether on purpose or not, should not happen. Seminars and meetings to educate teachers about their students and colleagues, respecting pronouns, allowing students to use the bathroom they're comfortable with, and preferred names are all things that can be extremely beneficial for all students. When you reach a point where you understand who you are and what you want, it is a big and scary milestone of life. When you finally figure out the pronouns you want you feel relieved but when someone such as a teacher assumes your gender because they didn't ask for your pronouns or call you a different name based on misunderstandings of policy that can make everything you work for seem pointless we are either at school or home after being in a closed off environment at home we shouldn't have to go to school and deal with teachers and staff who aren't accommodating and respectful there are no excuses for being hateful to their for the student for who they are and that hate should not be project, projected on a student because of someone's unfair views Thank you, Ms. Blanchard. 
Um, and finally, we have Mr. Joseph Kane representing the Parent Community Advisory Board. Good evening, Madam Chair and School Board and everyone else. Thank you for having us this evening. I'm Joe Kane, uh, Chair of the PCAT Parent Community Advisory Board. And I uh, didn't prepare any remarks this evening because I've been busy as ever. My board told me to come here and share a few things. I just want to start by saying, um, you know, we're tired, just as tired as you all are. Um, you know, I looked at my Facebook uh, this morning and four years ago, believe it or not, we were all in Annapolis uh, fighting to fix the gap. 1,500 of us rolled down to Annapolis to, uh, to call on Governor Hogan and the General Assembly to fix the gap. That was 2017. Uh, 2018 this time, we were here again uh, fighting because uh, we knew that the 2012 Jacobs Report, right? Uh, we had uh, aging schools facility, and so all that came to a head when all the schools were shut down because we had no heat, right? Uh, then you go to 2019. We were here again this time uh, because we had just had incident at Douglas High School, and we were trying to figure out uh, what this gun situation was with the school police. And then last year this time, we were here because we were heading into a global pandemic that would claim the lives of more than 500,000 people in America. Um, I'm tired, parents are tired, community members are tired, you all look tired. <laughs> um, we, we've been here with our kids for a whole year almost, uh, of distant learning, trying to main, maintain and trying to figure this thing out. And I think today the message that we wanna get across is as a school board, we need you all to to, to be our voice in the school board and hold the district accountable uh, for questions and get answers and get the details that families are looking for. Um, I want to direct our attention. If you go to baltimorecityschools.org dash backslash reopening dash questions, there's a page full of questions that parents and community members went to a town hall or something and asked questions. And instead of answering them, we just posted the questions online with no answers. Like that is not acceptable for people who, who want quite answers the questions. We have our own questions. We know how to get them. I thank Chair, uh, uh, Commissioner Bondima for coming to our board meeting last week. Uh, we owe you an email, but we know how to get our questions answered at a board. But as parents and community members who takes time to watch a town hall, to have their questions just put on a, on a website with no answers, it's just, we need you to hold accountable for stuff like that. You know, that's what we're looking for. Uh, we, you know that you've hired a CEO who've hired a staff um, and they are, the staff is tired and they've been working their tails off to get this done. But if we have a community and parents and folk who just don't have, they feel like they're not being communicated to or being part of the process, none of this is going to work. We're going to continue to see this divide, right? Um, I'll point you also, Commissioner Frank, you asked the question earlier, um, how well are is the school district um, aligning with the CDC's guidelines when it comes to asymptomatic testing. Um, we know that Baltimore City Public Schools is going above and beyond what the CDC calls for in that arena. But when we look at other things that CDC acts for, right, um, they, one of the things they call out as being the most important things is community and stakeholder collaboration in development of these plans. Like, we have not seen that level of engagement, right, that, uh, that families have asked for. And I think that's why we continue to see this clash, if you will, of, 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 of ideas, of pains, because we weren't at the table. Now, we can say there were meetings held over the summer where people weren't invited, but that is in show. That is thing, we, things that people have been complaining about since day one. Um, I know I'm kind of rambling, but I think I just want to really show that people are tired. We need y'all as the school board to hold the district accountable, ask the hard questions, don't have foolishness on the website, we uh, it, 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 it meet deadlines so families have the tools to make decisions that are best for their family. Uh, we as PCAB, as you all know, we think that uh, we know that families out here who are in need of this type of support, um, but we're asking other families who may not have such a dire need to keep their children at home um, until it's safe, um, because we don't want to put more people in harm's way than has to be. Uh, thank you all. Uh, look forward to the, watching the conversation tonight. Um, thank you, Mr. King. 
Um, at this point, I'm going to uh, turn it over to the board exec for the remainder of uh, public comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, we have a video from Ms. Tori Grace. And uh, she is a member of Youth as Resources. Hi, my name is Tori Grace, and I am Chair of Youth as Resources Board of Directors. Um, I'm 19 years old, and I've been with PR for six years now. Hello, my name is Makaya Spell. I am 18 years old. I go to Benjamin Franklin High School, and I have been with YAR for about six months now. So, Youth as Resources has been working around school police accountability um, So since 2015. And um, around that, we, well, we pretty much started that work from our work around disability awareness. And we found out if you are more likely to be arrested, if there's city school um, police officers around at all. Recently, we have held five focus groups. And data shows from the survey and the focus groups that 60% of students wanted to remove school police while 20% was unsure. It affected me because it was like, they are kind of a reason not to go to school because some school police are just like, have like, you have power, so you abuse it. And they just nitpick, I guess. Even though I'm a senior, I'm also an aunt, and one day I will have my own children. And I believe they will feel safer in school without school police. School police tend to make children feel unsafe and like they're in harm's way because of what's going on now with police officers. As a whole, Uses Resources supports efforts to replace school police with support for students. Thank you. This is why YAR supports the Council of Not Cops initiative. Okay, uh, next we have a video from Ms. Kayla Bryce, uh, and she attends the Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women. Hello, my name is Kayla Bryce. I am 15 years old. I am in the 10th grade and I go to the Baltimore Leisure School for Young Women. Safety in school to me, it looks like students looking happy. They're, they're happy to be there. They feel safe. They feel comfortable. Um, it sounds like the students, you know, talking about topics, you know, would seem a bit controversial, but they feel safe in that surrounding to be able to talk about those things. Um, it would sound like the sound of trust and the sound of comfortableness. I would definitely like to see more guidance counselors, um, therapists in our building, in our building, mediators. Uh, I think sometimes self defense class because we all are all girls school, and in this world and society, females do get put in certain uncomfortable situations, and I feel like the school and the world itself doesn't really teach us that we have to learn from experience. So I'd like to see more classes or people teaching us about stuff like that. I feel as though that time and time again, that police have shown that they cannot always 100% protect us. And if the students don't feel comfortable with those police in the building, how can they trust them? How can the community and the parents trust them to be able to protect their students and their daughters. I would say that part of the reason this is dangerous is because we have the high rate, we have police brutality in our community. And because of that, there are parents and there are students who will not feel comfortable 
with a police with policemen or police women in their building. And if they're not comfortable in that building, it will cause issues. And there, I'm pretty sure most likely there will be a case where police brutality will happen in a school. So how do you expect students to feel safe if they're afraid of the people that are supposed to protect them? He was always comfortable and nice to everyone. Um, sometimes he would, when we had parties and stuff, he would watch and help the kids. He would definitely be, you know, definitely be supportive to the kids that had negative backgrounds or came from terrible homes. And he'd be helpful and supportive to them. And he was just all around nice and person, a nice and a pretty cool guy. They could be a guidance counselor. They could be a therapist. They could be a person who sits down with students, helps solve issues and conflict. They could talk about the experience of the outside world and teach other and teach students or staff members how to protect themselves in certain cases or in certain troubles that we might experience or have. Okay, next we have a video from Kal Kalia White, um, also Baltimore Leadership Tool for Young Women and Youth as Resources. I'm Kalia White. I'm 16 years old. I'm in a 10th grade and I go to Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women. Safety in the school looks like having backing up, backing up children mentally and physically also, and not mentally joining a child for all they got. And that's really it. I would like to see trained mediators and um, licensed therapists in schools to help children. No, there's never been a time in my life and I thought we had enough of those things. I had a negative situation happen with me and the police. And I feel like if the police would have listened to my side or like viewed try to walk in my shoes from the situation, it wouldn't have escalated like it did. So I would say if Baltimore City Public Schools had more funding and had more money to implement security systems inside of the schools, we would not need police officers to protect us from outside threats. The school building would do that for us. I would say calling Baltimore a place of danger where children live in is not doing anything but implementing the culture for the entire children. If you put police in schools and treat children like they're criminals, you're not doing anything to help fight the prison pipeline situation that's going on in predominantly black schools right now. I feel like if school police officers are taught how to mediate situations and de-escalate them, we should give them jobs at schools to do that same, very same thing that they were doing as good police officers, but only without the stigma of being a police officer. I would definitely spend it on getting better technology for Baltimore City, for Baltimore City public schools and getting more books and getting more books for children, for libraries, because I know my school, we don't really have a library.
Okay, uh, next we have a video from Amir Ali. Um, Amir is a BC uh, City Schools teacher. Good evening, my name is Amir Ali. I'm a Baltimore City resident and a public school teacher. Thank you for taking some time to consider my thoughts on police for schools. My first point is that our communities deserve to learn safe environments. That's actually my only point. I'll expand on it to say that this is a recurring point that I have heard regarding the movement for police free schools. After a summer of meeting with Baltimore City youth to discuss their perspectives on policing in their schools. The experiences were as diverse as you would expect, but safety was the point that stuck out the most. Many students crave positive adult interactions and they deserve them. They want to enter a school building and know that they are safe because their peers and adults work to create these environments. However, in too many of our schools, that's not happening, despite the fact that we spend millions, plural, on policing our children in their own schools. Our students are not getting what they deserve. The distraction here would be to demonize police, many of whom are members of our communities. However, policing is still not the answer. Instead, the shift should be made to discuss community priorities. And to make that shift, we have to refer to our budget and demonstrate the difference in district priorities and community priorities. I want to work in schools with, commu and with communities that show that they prioritize safety in the truest sense. Resources are finite in a district that is consistently underfunded. We only have but so much. Knowing this truth, it is alarming to compare a police budget with the budget for student wholeness. In past years, 2019, for example, we accepted the strange fact that police over time was the total amount that we spend on student wholeness. I always pause here when I share that fact um, because it's, it's scary. The amount that we spend on school police over time was more than what we spent on making sure our students were as close to whole as possible. What does it say about our priorities? It says that we prioritize access, student access to policing over their access to wholeness. That's alarming, not normal, and students and communities are asking. In closing, I ask us to readjust our priorities and move policing our schools to increasing safety in our schools by hiring more trauma-informed counselors, trauma-informed mentors, trauma-informed nurses, and trauma-informed teachers who are trained to give our children what they deserve, and that's safer schools. Thank you. Okay, uh, next I have an email to be read. So give me one moment. Okay, this email is from Ms. Brittany Johnstone. Uh, good evening, school board. Good evening, school board of commissioners and Dr. Santelisis. As a school-based clinician in the district, I see firsthand the inequitable access students in Baltimore City have not only to mental health services and supports, but the wraparound care and supports inside and outside of school that evidence have demonstrated is vital to supporting a student's psychological, emotional, and physical safety. My colleagues and I do not have the resources we need, and there are simply not enough district employed school based mental health providers to meet the growing need for counseling, social emotional learning and restorative practices within our schools. As a district employed school based mental health provider, I am writing today to ask the board and CEO to make a public commitment to endorsing HB 1089 and HB 496. The board and CEO endorsing these monumental pieces of legislation will signal to BCPSS students, educators, families, and community members that the district is serious about realigning the district's budget and programming to center student safety by providing them access to more wellness supports and removing punitive systems of policing from our school buildings and campuses. Supporting HB 1089 and HB 496 makes fiscal sense and it is common sense. When we know better, we do better. 
And decades of research have shown that police and systems of policing in our schools do not make students and communities actually safer. They do not increase mental wellness and they do not prevent the mass tragedies that weigh heavily on the minds of every educator or family member who sends their child out the door to school each morning. I submit this public comment today on behalf of my colleagues who like me want to see BCPSS be a true safe haven for our students so that student wholeness goals boldly laid out for us, that these student wholeness goals boldly laid out for us in 2017-2018 by Dr. Santelis can be achieved. We cannot do that while we continue to fund school police despite their going over budget year after year. We cannot do that while we continue to underfund and underspend on social emotional learning and wholeness supports. We cannot do that while school counselors, school social workers, and school psychologists are understaffed. I humbly request your public support of HB 496 and HB 1098. BCPSS students deserve counselors, not cops, and police free schools. Brittany Johnstone, Lisa Austin, James Hyatt, Ranga Adapuda, Nicolette Hansi, Hansi Giannis, Krista Horan, and Joyce Neal. Okay, next, uh, Ms. Keisha Goodwin, and uh, she's commenting live. Ms. Goodwin, are you on? And if you're on your phone, you can hit star six to unmute. Okay, we will come back to Ms. Goodwin. Uh, next, I have an email to be read from Michael Farmer. Okay, Michael Farmer with the Baltimore Algebra Project. Uh, why, why police officers shouldn't be in schools? Police shouldn't be in schools at all. School is literally for students to learn from that shouldn't involve the police. If we're being completely honest, the police don't have the training nor the temper to be around children and students. They are not trained enough to deal with a mentally ill person or a person with a disability, um, invisible disabilities included. They are only trained to deal with people breaking the law and they can barely do that without uh, using excessive force or getting trigger happy. If regular police officers can't do that, then what makes us think that's gonna be the same inside of a school? People see what the police do on a daily basis. Students see what the police do on a daily basis. Kids are living with the result of what the police do on a daily basis, have done on a daily basis. Whether it be good or bad, we see what the police have done on a daily basis. So why would we wanna bring them into schools where they be used as threats to scare us and the line that they are protecting us from what's outside as a cover up. If we taught ourselves how to heal and try to reverse all the generational trauma, we would barely need the police. The police being used as a scare tactic because the police are being used as a scare tactic because we failed to properly handle our emotions, communicate, acknowledge when we as a society are wrong, shouldn't be taken out of students because of emotionally damaged and controlling adults. Michael. Okay, next I have an email from Ivan Roberts, also of the Baltimore Algebra Project. As a former C Baltimore City student, I'm against the usage and employment of school resource officers. Since its origination in 1967, SROs have been used to detain and limit the ability of students as they were formed to respond to student-led movements after the desegregation of the school system. Baltimore being the only district in Maryland with its own school police force, and being predominantly black slash brown shows that these officers were only present to police black and brown youth. Over the years, this department has assaulted and harassed many of the same students they're supposed to protect. Rather than de-escalating situations or working towards an alternative, SROs have been given complaints based on their conduct or have been caught assaulting students, such as the Vanguard incident. And this isn't just significant to Baltimore schools or even at the local level. This is the reality for many students as well. I attend Bowie State University, and this is also an issue there. School police officers have a history of antagonizing, exploiting the students they are supposed to protect. An alternative would be counselors or student support programs that focus on restorative practices and work directly with the community along with the students and their families. Ivan. Uh, next, I have a video from 
Emotep Simba. Can you hear me? Oh, Miss Goodwin. Uh, Miss Goodwin. Say so if you're on your phone, you need to hit star six. Did you just call me? N now I can hear you. Yes. OK. Yeah, in three minutes. All right. Good evening, CEO and commissioners. I hope all is well. Today I'm here as a parent and community member to ask what are the explicit protocols and guidance for reporting a racist BCPSS personnel? I want to start by saying there are some great non-melanin personnel. My son has been and is taught by great teachers and I have also witnessed some great non-melanin educators. However, there are folks that need to be reported for being a racist. Is there a Title IX personnel of color who handles these matters? Is there any data collected on these matters that have been reported? And if so, what is the outcome? Does the district explicitly ask questions about racism on a student and guardian surveys? What data is available if it is and where can I find it? There is work being done with mental injury and trauma and employee conduct, hence why I was purposefully and intentionally including looking for racism reporting in the policies. I would like to have a step by step process for reporting these type of issues. It is very heartbreaking to have students taught and in spaces with hateful teachers. Please help me. Uh, thank you, Ms. Goodwin. And if you are, there's some information being put in the chat. I don't know if you're using Teams or not, but there's some information about how to report um, the incidents you mentioned uh, and some other information. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, uh, the, we have a video from Emotep Simba. Hey, what's going on, y'all? It's from Hotep Simba, uh, Choice Program, uh, alumni, RPCV, Return Peace Corps volunteer from Ecuador, 2017 and 2019. Uh, associated DAI, if it matters, <laughs> supporting the seed trading project in Zambia. Uh, more importantly, um, I'm here is just another concerned, uh, proud Baltimore City resident. Um, and I'm here to really just kind of uh, express and convey, so, express and convey uh, support for um, uh, funding and uh, supporting mentoring services over uh, school policing within Baltimore City Schools. Totally understand uh, that they are there ideally to serve and protect. Um, however, uh, you know, there have been a lot of cases in which they have served, uh, uh, but however, realistically and very much in the environment we are in today and that we have been historically, um, people who, who look like the majority of people who make up Baltimore City, uh, 60 63% being uh, people of African descent, uh, that encompasses the entire diaspora, Afro-Latino, Caribbean, West Indies, Afro-Eurasian, Afro-Asian. I mean, there are little, we can go into all of that, but mo most importantly, um, I, yeah, there's this disconnect. And I think as opposed to guns and handcuffs, we should more so have caring adults. Um, let's swap the officers for mediators. Uh, 
positive mentors. Um, we have a national uh, mentoring affiliate here led by the brother Sadiq Ali. So very much uh, really just wanted to convey um, and express my support uh, for swapping police officers uh, with more caring and positive uh, mentors and mentoring services. Thank you. Peace. Okay, our final um, public comment for the evening will be from uh, Mr. Eric Ford. And give me one moment. Greetings, my name is Eric Ford, Director for the Choice Program at UNBC. I'm also here representing the State Advisory Group, uh, which is a part of the Governor's Office of Crime Prevention, Youth and Victim Services. Um, also representing the Juvenile Justice Reform Council. Uh, I am a member of the Open Society Institute's Leadership Council. And most importantly, I'm a mentor and a father of two sons. Uh, for more than 30 years, the Choice Program has worked with young people to disentangle them from the juvenile legal system. And for that reason, uh, I am here today to offer this message. I come to you as a Choice alum, uh, one who started his career in the Cherry Hill community in 1993. And since that time, I have 28 years of experience uh, working with young people um, in Park Heights, in uh, Southeast Baltimore, um, in Job Corps, um, in, in, in different human service programs. Uh, so I've seen firsthand how um, a young person's life can be changed by an incident that starts in school uh, through whether it's a minor fight or um, a, a disagreement with a teacher, and that turns into an arrest. Uh, which leads into into that person um, getting ensnarled in the school to prison pipeline. It is well documented that in Maryland, while black students only account for 35% of the student population, they make up 66% of those arrested. Black students are also the only group who are arrested at a disparate rate relative to their enrollment. So, uh, so just as you know, choice, you know, embarked on change um, about three years ago. Um, uh, we are respectfully urging the Baltimore City Schools to reject the antiquated and dangerous models of policing in favor of restorative responses, trauma-informed care, mentoring, community schools, and healing. Thank you. All right, uh, Madam Chair, back to you. Okay, okay, thank you. And thank you to the folks who uh, submitted and, um, sh sorry, submitted and shared uh, comments with us this evening. Uh, board members, based on the public comments, are there any additional items that any board member would like um, to pull from the consent agenda? Okay. Uh, if not, is there uh, is there uh, a motion to approve items 8.01 through 8.03? So moved. so moved, Richardson. Okay, got Richardson second. Was that Bondima? Yes, please. Okay. 
And all those in favor, uh, Commissioner Bondima? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Brooks. Brooks? Yes. Commissioner, Commissioner Frank? Frank? Yes. Commissioner uh, James? Yes. Commissioner McFadden? Yes. Commissioner Reed? Yes. Did you hear Chris Marie said yes, Linda? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I didn't. <laughs> I'm sorry, Commissioner Thank Richardson. You. Thank you. Yes. Okay, Commissioner Roberts. Yes. Commissioner Sykes. Yes. Thank you. And um, and I'm in favor. Are uh, any opposed? Oh, there are no opposed. Oh, this one is uh, unanimous. So we have uh, this passes. We have ten in favor. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Bondi. Do you have a question? Yeah. No, I want to make a quick statement. I, if you don't mind, Commissioner Chair. Um, I want to thank um, Commissioner Brooks and um, I want to thank Commissioner Richardson for the work that they've done and um, and uh, Al, Mr. Gann for the work that he put in for the past two years to get us through this um, strategic priorities and we have a lot more work ahead and I want to thank the community, the, fa the staff and, and all the people who assist us to get us to this point. I want to say thank you. Thank you. Okay. And now we're moving to um, the remaining items. And we had, uh, it, it was 11, um, sorry, yeah, 11.01, 11.02 that had the same question, which was around um, the participation uh, of charter schools. And this was for the uh, uh, to uh, procurements. Yes, so I'm happy to answer that question. So for our uh, COVID testing plan, we have included charters in that plan. So they will have access to the same testing that we're providing in other schools. Um, that was part of our strategy early on. We also consulted with the um, with some of our charter partners to um, get their thoughts about that. But the feeling is that standing up a testing program takes a lot of research um, and partners uh, and a lot. It's a big undertaking. So um, doing that on a school by school level would be pretty difficult. Um, um, and so this sense of charters and our sense was that this is something that it makes sense for us to um, provide to all schools. Thank you, Alyssa. All right, uh, were there any other questions? Okay, if not, um, can we, uh, can we, uh, Vote on these two together. Um, 11.01. Did I do that right again? Yeah, 11.02. Is there a motion uh, to approve these these two items? So moved. Reed. So moved. Thank you. I got uh, Commissioner Reed. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Robert. Roberts. I heard. Okay. Thanks. And those uh, in favor, uh, Commissioner Bondima. Yes. This one. Thank you. Yes. yes. Commissioner Brooke. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner Frank. Yes. Commissioner McFadden. Yes. Commissioner Reed. Yes. Commissioner, Commissioner Richardson. Yes. Commissioner, Commissioner Roberts. Roberts. Yes. Commissioner Roberts. Yes. Commissioner Roberts. Yes. Yeah. And in favor. Uh, so again, uh, these two items also passed. Uh, we have nine in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to turn it over uh, to the Office of Human Capital. 
for the first reader uh, for policy EBBB incident reports. Uh, this is the information and discussion item. <sighs> Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, Commissioners and Dr. Sanselisis. My name is uh, Jerome Jones. I'm the Director of Labor Relations for in the Office of Human Capital and have worked with uh, very, uh, very much with uh, Sally Robinson out of the Office of Legal Counsel and Lisa Smith Sherrod uh, out of the Chief of Schools Office. And so we bring to you the uh, First reader of policy EBBB incident reports. Next slide. So the purpose of this policy is uh, we have a lot of policies and regulations which uh, require principals to report incidences. So we attempted to put this policy together so that in one place principals could go to find uh, consolidated reporting requirements for the policies and regulations, as well as tying the current uh, policies and regulations into uh, uh, federal, state, and local requirements. Next slide, please. Uh, these are all of the various policies and or instances that are covered in this policy and accompanying regulation. Uh, in many places, we refer back to the policies uh, that are listed here in some instances in this policy and the company regulation, we actually spell out the incidences and the uh, what the incidents are, how the um, forms and uh, what the requirements are, because they are processes that require principals to fill out uh, forms and do uh, reporting, such as <clears throat> for workplace accident or injury. That is actually a process that principals have to go through. And so we spell that out in this policy. Next slide, please. Uh, the policy defines a uh, principal supervisor. It also defines staff, including those employed by public charter or operator led schools. Uh, we talk about school grounds, critical injury and reportable incidences. Uh, the accompanying regulation includes uh, employees' responsibilities to report incidences, identifies the appropriate uh, board policy and regulation, and also has the processes and forms that must be completed. And it basically, as I said before, it serves as a central repository for principals, supervisors, public charter operators, and operator-led schools for any incident reporting requirements. Uh, when the regulation, uh, this is the first draft of this regulation. We understand that as new reporting requirements come on board, we will add them to the policy and accompany regulation. And if there are changes in state laws or local uh, reporting requirements, we can add those changes into this and we'll update the uh, processes and procedures uh, that are implemented and re that require reporting. Um, we have engaged with uh, a number of stakeholders. Part of what you've seen, what is in the policy and regulation, uh, includes um, information from chief of schools. Uh, the Pazaza Executive Board has the um, policy and regulation, and uh, they are looking at it. We've gotten some, uh, we sent it to school police and student conduct for, uh, and attendance. Uh, we're going to reach out to Baltimore City Legal and Health Departments because part of our workers' compensation um, requirements, we are, of course, covered under that by uh, uh, Baltimore City. So we will be reaching out to them for feedback on this uh, charter advisory on February 11th. We presented to them, got some feedback. Uh, operator led schools, uh, school based staff, we got feedback on February 2nd. For that, we are sending this to all the other union partners. Uh, PCAB, we were on their schedule for February 18th to, to present. However, they had to change uh, in, in their uh, agenda. And so they advised that they would take a look at the policy and provide feedback. 
Uh, there were select principals and middle schools that provided some feedback to the policy and regulation first, and then the equity office will be ongoing. And are there any questions or feedback? Mm -hmm. any, any questions or comments on board members? Okay. This just to remind this is a first reader. And so if you do have questions, uh, uh, you, can all, you can also send those in, but not seeing any this evening. Thank you. Um, and this day we'll, we'll look forward to the second reading. Thank you. I'm, yeah. I need to apologize and um, uh, to the um, Office of um, New Initiatives. Uh, we got so carried away in, in conversation and discussion earlier with the with the uh, reopening plan that I I totally skipped an agenda item. So I'm good. It, it is also information and discussion, but I just want to apologize to folks who who uh, thought that they were to come on a little bit earlier. So we're going to have a presentation from the Office of New Initiatives on the renaming request for James Mosier Elementary and for Calverton Elementary Middle. Good afternoon, I'm Angela Alvarez. I'm the Executive Director of the Office of New Initiatives. And I'm gonna have uh, uh, Lindsay introduce herself. I'm Lindsay Anderson. I work with Angela in the Office of New Initiatives. And Lindsay, do you actually wanna start us off? Sure. Um, so as you uh, probably remember, um, James Mosher and Calverton will be moving into their new 21st century buildings this fall. Um, part of that move and part of that plan is for Alexander Hamilton to close um, the elementary school students, uh, the early elementary school students in grades pre-K through two will go to James Mosher and the middle, the third through eighth grade students in the neighborhood will go to Calverton. So um, we're using this opportunity of merging and um, grades reconfiguring to consider um, new names and new identities for um, the Mosher and Calverton programs. Um, so this slide just illustrates the renaming policy requirements. Um, so um, we, and I think our next slide uh, d talks about the community engagement process, but um, we have formed a joint renaming committee for both schools that includes um, the Alexander Hamilton community and then community members and parents and staff from each uh, respective school. We have um, had several community conversations already and um, we'll continue those through February. Um, we are kind of in the blue square right now, um, sharing the request and the process in a public meeting. And then we will come back in March um, to ask you to vote on the new uh, names for the schools. So this just outlines our timeline. Um, as I mentioned before, we um, convened renaming committees in January, um, did some initial brainstorming in February, um, we're using this time, uh, you know, February to March to kind of whittle down um, a, a list of names that will be voted on um, in early March. Um, the schools are considering a variety of um, historical names that are historical to Baltimore um, and also nationally and internationally historical and also considering um, keeping both program names the same. Um, in January, um, we started gathering data, just name suggestions from um, the school communities. And as I mentioned, um, we've taken those name suggestions and then put them on kind of preliminary surveys. Um, that's what we're doing at this point to get feedback on the specific name suggestions. And then we'll use those names to determine um, a list of two or three names for a final ballot for voting. Um, we are also through this process um, considering names of uh, school programs that have closed in Baltimore City. Um, uh, we've talked with the board before about just the importance of keeping these names in our system. So um, some of these names are, are being considered by the community as the new names for the school programs, in addition to, um, you know, names that have come from the community. Um, so far, what we've heard from the community um, 
there is a very strong uh, history, a very uh, deep history in the neighborhood that um, Mosher and Calverton are situated in. So we've heard a lot about that from the community, um, specifically um, the James Mosher Baseball League, um, which started in 1960. Um, it's said to be the longest continuously operating African American Youth Baseball League in the country. That's a it's a very important um, kind of uh, cornerstone in the community, serving many many youth. And so we've just we've heard a lot about the importance of that program and and the James Mosher name, um, and just that um, both schools, Mosher and Calverton, are are real institutions in the community. Um, that uh, the community feels strongly about, you know, their names not necessarily reflecting the, the actual people who they're named after, but just institutions that have been in the community for a, um, a long time. Um, some of the names that we are considering um, are on in the in uh, the next square. Um, so Calverton is considering Henrietta Lacks, Katherine Johnson, Elijah Cummings, um, Chadwick Bozeman, and a few others. Um, Mosher, uh, among the names for Mosher are Maya Angelou, Juanita Jackson Mitchell, Alice Pinderhughes, um, and a few others as well. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, we uh, are also considering keeping the names the same because of the feedback that we've gotten from the community. So that's also an option. And so we'll come back um, at the second meeting in March to share the results of the community um, voting process. Um, and um, we'll let you know if we're if the name is changing or if, or if people are um, uh, deciding to keep the name. I think um, uh, feedback from Calverton looks like we're likely to come up with a new name with Mosher. Um, there's some real consideration about the fact that the you know the person from the 1800s is not who the name has come to symbolize in the community. So we'll keep you updated. We want to make sure this is respectful where community is. Uh, and then we don't lose that history too, because it's also important. And also connect to with Commissioner Janita sharing at the start of this meeting, because Alexander Hamilton, you know, uh, I mean, Alexander Hamilton, sorry, James Mosher was um, one of those schools that was a white school when we were segregated uh, and then became a black school to, as the neighborhood changed. Um, and so that that community organization that is long term, it still has many of the original founders that are part of it, that name has a different meaning for them. And that's important for us to, to understand as well. Thank you. Um, any, uh, any questions or comments from board members? Okay. Thank you again, um, and thank you for your patience. And again, I, I apologize for, uh, for skipping and, and not reading carefully, but uh, we will uh, be watching uh, and listening for what happens. And March 23rd, uh, we'll hear what the, to, what the communities have decided in terms of our suggestions for names for the schools. Thank you. Thank you. I, yeah. So now I'm uh, going to just check with uh, two of our, our board chairs to see, uh, committee chairs, to see if, if you, you'd like to share anything from recent committee meetings. Uh, the operations committee I know has met. I don't know if Commissioner Roberts would like to share um, any information from that meeting. Madam Chair, I do not have anything to bring um, from committee. However, I do want to highlight procurements 1101 and 1102 this evening we voted and they passed and I'm very very excited for us to one lead the state in implementing asymptomatic testing for our students which is another layer of ensuring a safe environment for our students to return to um, and I also want to thank the staff for working so diligently around the clock to ensure that this made it today so that we can ensure that it's implemented and in place for our students moving forward. So thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. And then uh, Commissioner Brooks, uh, policy committee, was there anything you'd like to, um, to highlight or share from the policy committee meeting? 
Um, so just the general, um, we would love to have continued feedback and support from community members, um, particularly around sort of levels of engagement and sort of what does authentic engagement look like in terms of not only creating and crafting policy, um, but to also make sure that that, uh, that feedback is actually sort of uh, institutionalized and codified and that we really have quality feedback. And so we just want to invite folks to continue to weigh in um, and to also uh, let us know if the process by which we are doing this engagement does not work to suggest different and alternative ways to do that, especially as we think about sort of um, how do we sort of structure meaningful engagement uh, with um, our constituents moving forward. Thank you. And and just a reminder to, to uh, uh, folks who are, who are watching, especially uh, our public, um, I, one of our meetings uh, committees we know does meet during the day and that might be difficult, but uh, the majority of our committees are meeting uh, late in the afternoon in uh, the hopes that people will join in. Um, each of them has time for public comment. So that is another time when uh, folks are invited to uh, let the board members know uh, your feelings about any of the issues that are coming before them. So I encourage you um, to, to please um, consider those. And um, speaking of the meetings, um, the upcoming meetings, um, teaching and learning will be meeting on March the 12th. I'm sorry, March the 2nd, uh, 3.30 to 5.30. Um, our next board meeting will be on March the 9th. Um, operations committee will meet on March the 16th at 10.30 a.m. Uh, policy committee meets again on March the 16th at 3.30 p.m. And the Parent Community Advisory Board, PCAB, meets on uh, March the 18th at 6.30 p.m. Okay, so uh, board members, uh, I think we, uh, there's an additional time this evening if board members want uh, to uh, have any additional you know. conversations. So don't this want is to, right? the time right. that we are you that we've allotted? Are you keeping your light uh, safe? Uh, yeah. Fifteen minutes. Well, you can test it out. I'm gonna. Uh, All right, can you turn around? Can folks, please, please mute. Okay, thank you. So, um, I'll open it to to the board if there are any additional um, comments. And uh, thank you, Dr. Santelises, for joining in here. I am. Uh, Commissioner Reed, go ahead. I just appreciate the uh, the young people, the the students. I mean, it's pretty hard for them sometimes. One, they have to get away from their studies to come here, and two, uh, as a 16 year old, 17 year old, it's really hard to give a public speech. So I'm impressed what they did, how they did it. And uh, I just appreciate their passion and the idealism. I may not always agree with what they say, but I, I, I really appreciate what they do and how they do it. Thank you. Yeah, so this is uh, Commissioner Brooks. Um, you know, so I, I was also in uh, joining you, uh, uh, Commissioner Reed, and sort of uh, uh, deeply um, encouraging and supporting and uplifting uh, sort of the young people who came and spoke tonight um, about sort of the things that impact them um, and uh, sort of how uh, they begin to own their own voice and their own experience and to hold us accountable to that. Um, and I also want to sort of sit in uh, in this space of wondering about our student who talked specifically about the ways in which our own staff members are still ill prepared to support the LGBT needs of our students in this district. Um, and that sits with me in this moment of deep frustration, also knowing that at the same time we are making progress and taking steps and strides forward to do that work. And so what I'm sort of would love to hear about, um, particularly sort of uh, how, how are folks responding um, to sort of uh, what that particular student said? Um, and sort of also, uh, it would be nice to hear a little bit about how we close the gap between sort of what we say we're doing to support our students and sort of what actually sort of materializes so that they know that they won't be misgendered uh, in their classroom experiences, for example. OK, 
Okay. So, I, I mean, are you asking this as an open question or, or would this be something that perhaps we could have uh, come to, to the board at another time with a little more information for you? Uh, yeah, sure. either one is fine. I just, I, I just, I just know that it's important, um, and and we need to sort of begin to sort of uh, continue to elevate this because I think to have a young person come to a public board meeting um, with this level of concern um, is is it, I, for me that's a major flag. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Commissioner Sykes. Thank you. Um, I wanted just to take the time to say. Uh, to, to publicly say thank you to my my colleague and also um, my my uh, good friend Yasmin, um, who sits on ASCVC with me, the Associated Student Congress of Baltimore City. Um, and because of some of the, the issues that we have been raising that, that we have seen, it has been important uh, for us as we have talked in our last and a few back, uh, a few um, board meetings back that we were launching, that we'll be um, adding a position to our board for the, the LGBTQ plus liaison. Um, and that position is really to work with, identify the problems that we see um, that is hindering our LGBTQ plus uh, students to not only be their authentic selves, but to focus on their education. And because of that, I'm, I'm glad that um, we have this position and that we, will, that we will continue to work with not only um, our, our, our uh, partners throughout the district, but especially our, our policy committee to talk about some of the issues within our policies that we're seeing and where we might possibly um, see some hiccups within policies. Um, so I just really want to say thank you to Yasmin for really bringing up the, the this this issue because she talked about it and she literally said everything so well. So I just was wanted to raise that and say that, that this is a work in progress and that this is something um, that it's not going to take just an overnight, but it's going to take some time to really put some practice into place to know that we're actually supporting our LGBTQ plus uh, students. Good. Uh, Dr. Sanchelese, do you want to weigh in here? Sure. I think what I would say um, on this one is, you know, to just highlight that the student experience is always and should always be the litmus for the ground we have yet to cover, right? And so as I was reflecting on Yasmin's testimony this evening, that the piece that struck me was the layers of which we have to do this work of protecting students, creating safe space for, for students, what does it mean to engage young people in all of who they are and to create the spaces for that is multi-layered. And I think one layer is absolutely policy, but policy without actually taking a deep look at the implementation and how it plays out in the day-to-day -day, um, experiences of students is incomplete. And so what it brought to mind for me is that Yes, absolutely, we have a long way to go, but how are we also checking along the way to make sure that what we're writing on paper um, is actually being pressure tested through what the young people are experiencing? And, and there were many layers to the testimony, right? And so I think that's the piece that is consistent when we are talking, whether we're talking about LGBTQ, whether we are talking about you know other issues like school policing and what students experiences are there so for me it really is always keeping that student experience as the litmus test of whether or not our policy is having the impact and whether our implementation is at the place it needs to be and there's clearly a gap um, in in what's happening but i think i think it's an ongoing process that requires us to always pressure test through the lens of what young people are experiencing. Yeah, and Dr. Santelli says I have a, I, I saw um, another hand. I don't want to jump in before uh, someone else wants to go. Uh, I saw uh, Commissioner McFadden, so I'll let him go and then we'll come back if that's OK. Or Commissioner McFadden, uh -oh. is that all right? Dr. Brooks can go ahead. Oh, thank you, Commissioner McFadden. 
Um, so um, actually, so, uh, you know, I really wanted to, uh, given that sort of, um, uh, sort of we are slated to have, uh, you know, uh, young people sort of back in school buildings um, in the next couple of weeks um, and sort of going and rolling out throughout the, um, the next few months. Um, I would love it if we could talk a little bit more about sort of like the role of uh, social emotional learning um, and sort of like what are the steps that we're actually taking to ensure that those students who we're going to have sort of access to in person. Um, sort of what are we doing to take care of that? And sort of I would love to hear some ratios between sort of what our student um, to sort of uh, counselors are so that I can have a better sense of sort of what the actual social emotional experience is going to be like for those students who are in those physical spaces, um, but then also just the district wide initiatives to, to make sure that uh, we're, we're anting up when uh, when it comes to SEL. Yeah, I, I actually think, Commissioner Brooks, as we, one, um, take a look, you know, certainly at ratios, but I will tell you, even within the ratios, um, there is the question that we're asking now around what makes sense um, when we talk about whether it's recovery, whether we talk about, you know, how students um, will actually engage not just in as of March 1, but all along the way, we've been asking questions about the, uh, the social emotional learning needs. So it's part of why even in the virtual environment, we've asked this. Um, so it's an ongoing piece. And I think one of the things that might serve us well is to do a deep dive with the public and the board around all of those elements, because it isn't just about ratios. It's also about kind of the effectiveness and the preparedness for teams to be able to handle the, the multifaceted and frankly deluge of increase of student, you know, student need during a period like the last year. So one of the things I would offer up is that one, as we do our recovery planning, that I think we should be able to communicate out uh, how we're integrating that into all of the work and planning um, of recovery slash return slash how do we help young people who have experienced great isolation, disengagement, and increased pressure during this time reconnect as people as part of the wholeness work, I think is more than just kind of a quick two to three minute answer now, I would offer up um, a deeper look at what we're doing at a variety of levels. Um, but we do have, for example, you know, it's part of why we've worked on telemedicine and telecounseling during this time. And then the transition back, a lot of what um, schools have been working on is, is what just are some of those routines and community building um, practices that need to be put in place you know, even long before we start talking about, you know, where are you on this particular reading assessment or math assessment, that a lot of it is around that rebuilding of community, reconnecting in terms of relationship um, and those practices. But, you know, so I would offer that I think as an ongoing or a future uh, deep dive, because I, I don't think it's one or two things that, that are just captured by, you know, a ratio. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, Dr. Santelises. And I think one of the things that was really clear to me, and, and I and I begin to name this more explicitly, we know that it's the context in which students experience their lives that has one of the largest impacts on their health and their academic achievement. Um, and so someone asked me sort of, uh, will this nine months sort of impact people for a lifetime? I said, not meeting this moment with the adequate social and emotional development and sort of support services will ultimately make sure that we lose a generation if we don't begin to attend to the mental and emotional and spiritual health of the, st the students in Baltimore City School. So I think we definitely need to sort of, um, sort of uh, one, I would love that presentation, then two, uh, to sort of uh, make sure that it's actually meeting the needs of our students. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner McFadden, and then I see Commissioner Reed stand again, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Commissioner McFadden? I'm okay, um, um, Commissioner Chenier. Okay, Commissioner Reed. Uh, I guess this has been uh, the long haul for us as school boards and parents and students. Is the whole idea in terms of connectivity? Uh, a lot, all a lot of us believe that internet is a right, and also everyone should have it. But I guess the families. You have three people in the family. I see people on the screen, and they freeze. So I'm wondering whether you have 
regular families with three people using their internet at home, whether they really have connectivity can do their schoolwork, which gets me back to the whole idea of where have we moved in terms of our relationship with Comcast, where they're becoming a thought partner and a good business partner for the district district. Sure, Commissioner Reed. So one, I would ask uh, Chief High Cupboard, who really has been running point on the ongoing kind of communication. I don't, I don't necessarily see her in this space, but um, we'll see if she's here. Um, so that's one. And I think sure. two, the advocacy that um, the broader community has has brought that young people who are organizing and have organized around this, uh, members of our city council, city government, <clears throat> and even city delegation, I really do think have successfully begun pushing the needle much further along than where we were a year ago. I think the challenge still remains. And again, I don't know if Chief High Cupboard is on, um, but I think some of the challenge that remains um, are different questions of how uh, Comcast and others do their business um, in ways that make it easier and don't create more hurdles for families and students who want access, right? So a lot of what Chief High Cupboard has done has really been reframing how a company that, you know, to be honest, probably was not set up um, to serve the broad swath of our community um, and our students. And so I think some of that is, is just really pushing on some of the practices that they assumed, um, you know, were equal practices that quite frankly, um, were having disparate negative impact on our students, our families, and there's more to go. So Tina did tell me that she is here, so I'm gonna let her jump in but from my perspective i think that's a lot of it and why we still have some bumps is just when you're not set up and your frame and your target is not serving you know families you know that represent baltimore's a large portion of baltimore city public schools you have to relearn how you do your work and i think that's a challenge yep thanks dr Russ. i'm happy to jump in and share a little bit so just in analytics, we only have approximately 800 families who have taken advantage of the Comcast internet sponsorship from city schools. So the, first of all, that number, when we had approximately four to 5,000 families we thought were on internet essentials in the p for spring and summertime, right? Um, the translation is that families think that the hotspots are easier to navigate. That's just the reality that we've experienced. Um, having a hotspot that we give out to schools, uh, families through schools has been a much easier way to families to navigate. We had a cons we have a consultant working with us on our internet um, outreach, and he frankly has had to build a system where families can flag, flag for us, excuse my language, um, where they've had difficulty in signing on. And it has been issues like if a family lived in a house at one point and they moved, but they had a back Comcast bill, a new family coming into that house or apartment can't get onto Comcast. And so we did a little bit of that in the spring and Monique sent up to Spanish that, but the consultant really had to create a whole new system in order for us to mitigate those, those, those barriers for families getting on. So while we appreciate the push from city council and others around the Comcast internet speeds and approving the speeds of our internet, that really hasn't had a huge impact on us right now because we only have about 800 families who have signed on. We are gonna be doing additional push for Comcast. Um, last big push to see if there's other families who are on Internet Essentials to get them signed up for Comcast if they so desire. Um, but I did just meet with them last week to sort of talk through ways in which we can, you know, partner with them better and think about how we're working together. But the reality is, while we appreciate the increased speeds, we don't have that many families who have said that Comcast is the way they want to have their internet provided to them. And the T-Mobile hotspots and the Project Waves have been, you know, not Waves, but hotspots have been the primary driver. And then we also have the Project Waves work that is going on in schools as well. Thank you. Okay. I, I, yeah. Um, I saw Commissioner Frank, did you want to add anything as we're, we're... Yeah, just real quick, picking up very quickly from what Dr. Brooks um, talked about and Dr. Santelis's response, just to clarify, and if not clarify, ask that the presentation on the social emotional learning and supports of our students not be limited to just the returning students, but include those who have been learning virtually and will, who will continue to do so. 
that was my, my only point. Yeah, Thank no, you. absolute, absolutely, Commissioner Frank, uh, because I do think it is important to look at all the work we're doing, right? Not just what we're doing with uh, bringing students back, but all the work we have been doing um, since this began, really around the social emotional needs of our young people. So we can absolutely do that. Uh, Commissioner McFadden, and I think we we are, we have reached the time that we had agreed for discussion. Commissioner McFadden. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to um, remind um, the board members that at our teaching and learning committee meeting this month, there was an update provided to us on um, the blueprint and the work that is happening around student holdness. Um, I would just encourage us to revisit that, but also we may need to schedule some time um, Madam Chair, or with um, uh, Christian, Mr. Gant, to uh, just meet with Dr. Warren. Maybe some of the board members may need to have a check-in with her to get an update um, on the work that's happening, the increase of student learning sites and, and, and I'm sorry, intensive learning sites um, and some of the other supports that are, that are happening. Of course, we always can do better and improve um, but I think it's important for us to just check, check back on some of that information that we received. And if we need to schedule some additional meetings, I don't think anyone would be opposed to that. Great. Thank you. Another reminder, uh, uh, and, and we can still take a look at those meetings because they are recorded. So if you need, if, if someone would like to go back to review what happened at the last teaching and learning committee, we invite you to do so. Thank you all. Um, I, um, uh, we had, you know, agreed to a, a 15 minute period for this. But before we end, I do want to acknowledge that one of our board members had a very, very special day yesterday. And so before we, uh, you know, uh, get a, a motion to adjourn for the night, I just I, I want to ask uh, Commissioner McFadden if he would lead us <laughs> in what we need to say for uh, Commissioner McFadden. Uh, I'll listen. Uh, it's late, folks. Andy Frank, who had a birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Commissioner Frank. Happy birthday to you. Uh -oh. Yay! Very, very <laughs> much. Thank you, fellow <laughs> commissioners. Right. And I, I know you're happy Thank that you. we had the best McFadden. voice uh, to present that. <laughs> okay, so folks, is uh, any, any, there no objection? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved, Bundima. Thank you. Um, is, is there a second? Second, Frank. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any objection to adjour uh, adjourning for the evening? If not, no. uh, then I will say that the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank everyone who joined us this evening. Uh, please, please be safe uh, and take care of yourselves and have a happy end of the month of February. We'll see yeah, you thank in March. You. Good take night, care, everybody. everybody. Good night. Bye.